Good afternoon. Today is February 7th, 1999. We're here at the Morse Institute Library in Natick, Massachusetts, and continuing with our Veterans Oral History Project, today we have the pleasure of introducing Thomas L. Grady. Tom, good afternoon. Good afternoon. How are I'm you? Fine. Thank you. Um, where do you live, Tom, currently? North Natick. And how long have you lived there? Oh, 50 years almost. 50 years? 49, I think. Mm -hmm. May I ask you how old you are? 80, 80 and a half. And your mm. marital status? I'm a widower. Your wife's name? Mary Elizabeth. And I understand you have children? Yes. I had four, two boys and two girls. And grandchildren? Three and three great-grandchildren. And I understand two of your boys were in the Vietnam yes. War, you mm -hmm. mentioned? Yes. Mm -hmm. One was a helicopter pilot in the Army. The other was a, uh, a medic in the Air Force. And did you grow up in Natick? No, no. Where were From you? New Hampshire. I grew up in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. What was it like in New Hampshire many years ago? Well, I grew up in East Derry, Derry itself now is like a bedroom for Boston because of Route 93. East Derry is still almost the same. It's more, a little more countrified, and uh, and it, Alan Shepard lived in East Derry across the street from our house, a couple of streets up. He was in my sister Betty's class in high school. Do you remember so, him growing so up? I knew him quite well. Yes. What was he like as a youth? Well, I think I used to say, and I read this afterwards. His mother was trying to make him a mama's boy and he never was and his he had a reputation up there when he his his first shot in, in into space reporters came up asking about Alan and I remember one neighbor said the only thing she could remember was when he deliberately threw a stone through her kitchen window so Alan was kind of a wild kid really but he was a nice kid everybody mm -hmm. liked him mm -hmm. And what did your family do in New Hampshire? My father was a lawyer. He'd been in Boston and had bad health, went up there for his health and stayed. And uh, so we all grew up up there. And did he practice law he, in yes, New Hampshire yes. also? Mm -hmm. What was his specialty? He was a general lawyer. He did everything. And of course, in New Hampshire in those days, he may have been paid with vegetables at times or <laughs> cordwood. Sure. And your mother was an at-home mom? Yes. Uh -huh. And how many siblings did you have? I, there were seven in our family. I had three, three brothers and three sisters. Did you live a comfortable life? Yes, very. I grew up in the Depression and wasn't aware of it, even though we weren't wealthy. But the way my mother handled things, I never knew there were problems, you know. We always seemed to do pretty well in New Hampshire. I mean, a small town wasn't a place where a lawyer made an awful lot of money. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were comfortable. We got by. We had a huge house, 17 rooms, and uh, which, which uh, a lot of them were that size house in those days. Have you been back to see the house oh, in Oh, I go up years? a lot, yes, uh -huh. and just drive by it. Yeah. Now, what about your schooling? I went, oh, well, up there. I was in a, a, a one-room school. We all went through a one-room schoolhouse called Adams Female Academy in East Derry for six grades. My older sister and brother went eight grades in that one-room schoolhouse. And then we went to the village, which was the high school was Pinkerton Academy. And that's still in existence still today. There. Yes, it's a private school, and, and uh, the town pays for everyone's tuition and it's still the high school and now it's quite large it's it's grown and it's a great school it really is and even though it sounds like it's a private school is it in fact a public school yes mm -hmm. it, it's a private school but the town pays everybody's tuition mm -hmm. so there's no other high school in the town mm -hmm. and it when I went uh, surrounding towns used it as a high school too at the same time mm -hmm. but it was a very good school I think and still is it's much larger than it was then and, and how old were you when you graduated from high school? Probably 18, like most people, I think. And after that, what did you do? Well, I didn't do anything for a while. I think it was the Depression, 1936. Mm -hmm. I worked at odd jobs. That's when I started collecting, I mean, paying Social Security. I, was, I got a job nights in a cleaners. I always wanted to go to art school, and it wasn't until a couple of years later that I went to art school in Boston. 
Uh, now, did you pretty, have artistic talents as a child? Always did, yes. And, uh, and the only thing I excelled in was something that required drawing, <laughs> like uh, sometimes uh, geometry, maybe, you know? <laughs> That was it. I was always interested in drawing. So you worked odd jobs for a few years, and then at the age of about 20, you went 20, on to yes, art school. And yes. what was the name of the school? Vesper George in Boston. Vesper George. Yes. Is it still in existence? No, it, uh, it was up until just a few years ago. And uh, so it was quite, it was the oldest art school in Boston, I think, at the time. And that was a three-year course. And did you take it for three years? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you graduated? Yes. And then what? Then I always wanted to study illustration, and in those days that was the thing, illustration, magazines mostly, book illustration. And uh, I was told there was only one illustrator, who, a working illustrator who taught, and that was Harvey Dunn. And he taught in this Grand Central School of Art in New York three nights a week. So another fellow and I went to New York and got part-time jobs and during the day and we went to this, this class three nights a week, obviously in the Grand Central Station building. I was lucky in that my sister and her husband, the, he was in the hotel business and was a room clerk in a rather large hotel and if I ever went to New York I could call him up and he could put me up. <laughs> so he put my friend and I up for about two weeks while we looked for part-time jobs in a room to stay. And, uh, and that was great, and I really enjoyed it, but that was 1941. And uh, after Pearl Harbor, I kept getting letters from Roosevelt about needing me in the war. And I wasn't that good a student, and I left in March to come home because I, I was going to be drafted. I was no hurry to join. I knew it wasn't going to help my career. And I was drafted and went in actually May 1st, 1942. And, and I'm sorry, were you drafted or did yes. you go? Yes, no, I was drafted. I was in no hurry. May of 42, and so were you automatically in the Army? A automatically in the Army, Fort Devens, where everybody in the North, I think, went to. And after three days, was shipped to Florida and found myself in the Army Air Corps. So it had nothing to do with my doing. It was just luck. I was in the Army Air Corps. I've been fortunate my whole life. We were sent to Miami Beach where we stayed in hotels. We ate in cafeterias and we had lectures in movie theaters and we marched up and down boulevards and that's where we got the sort of indoctrination for uh, the Army where they gave you tests, decided what you might do and uh, I played the drum when I was a kid, and as a result of these tests, I was told I was going to radio school, and I had no interest in radio. And the reason was because I remembered the beat when they, when they gave us these tests with Morse code. I could remember the beat, and I could write it down each time. So they thought I'd make a great radio man, and I didn't want to, and they said, well, your next best is auto mechanic, which was worse. I had no interest in either of those things. And I went back to the hotel where my friends who came down from me, from, with me from Derry, New Hampshire, and I knew a lot of them. And I came back to the hotel and I said, gee, I guess I'm going to gunnery, uh, to radio school. And one of them said, oh, we're going to gunnery school. And I didn't even know what it was. And I remembered when they gave you the lecture of all the possibilities, they mentioned gunnery and they only mentioned it once, and they said nobody will mention it again unless you mention it first. Mm -hmm. So I went back to the sergeant and said, can I switch to gunnery? And he said, you sure can. Physical tomorrow, leave the next day. I had no basic training. When they were in such a hurry for gunners, I went right into gunnery school. So I never had basic training. Worried about it the rest of the war, because I had heard of master sergeants being sent back for basic. Mm -hmm. But they needed gunners then, later on, that was quite different. They just made people gunners whether they wanted to be or not. But at first it was strictly voluntary. So where did, where did it take you once you signed up? Went to Tyndall Field, Florida, which is 
the armpit of Florida, up near Pensacola. Uh, and uh, that was the gunnery school I went to. And it was very interesting. And I have to tell you, I didn't even know what gunnery school was. I said gunnery because my friends all did. I thought it was shooting at planes. I didn't know it was riding in them. <laughs> Until halfway through gunnery school, and they begin, they, it's all about guns and how to handle them. And then they show us this turret, and I realized it was something somebody wrote in. <laughs> and then I realized it was in a plane, you know. But it was fun. I didn't, uh, it, I just stayed with it. We, we uh, rode in AT6s, a, a two-seater trainer plane, trainer, where we'd sit in the rear cockpit with a 30 caliber machine gun. And we'd shoot at a target being towed by another train, uh, AT-6, some distance away. Uh, and uh, everyone had colored bullets. So a lot of people shooting at the same target, theoretically they could tell who hit it. But like I say, they needed gunners. Nobody flunked these courses. Mm -hmm. Everybody always passed. You know? mm -hmm. so, uh, and you had mentioned some friends went. Were you able to be with them yes. in Florida? Yes, mm -hmm. we went to gunnery school together, some of us, and, uh, and but then we got separated. After gunnery school, you get sent to different fields, and so I lost track of the people I had flown with, you know, then at, at gunnery school. And so where did you go after that, after Tindo Field? Then, you, it's a series of training phases, and it's usually a month or, or more at each base, a different training phase. And I spent a month at a B-17 base in Florida, Sebring, which is a racetrack today. And then we were all shipped to Arizona. And uh, the trip across the country, I really enjoyed seeing the country. And I had KP, which was great on a train because I spent it in a huge baggage car, which had wide open doors and just a two by four across and it was a great way to see the country so I think you're our first interviewee who said he he enjoyed KP because well, it was because of yeah. that see yeah. I was spent it in this car and those doors are so huge you could see the terrain going across the country but then when we get to Tucson Arizona we switched to B-24s and if you never flew in a 24 and you had flown in 17s. It, it looked like they were switching you to a box car, you know. There, it, no one wanted to switch to B-24s. Why? Because? Because the other one you were used to and it looked prettier. Mm -hmm. But the more you fly, the more you get used to it. And we were stuck with B-24s. That was it. And from there on we go from, what, Tucson to El Paso to Topeka to Kansas City. Each place for about a month different training phase, and you don't know it, but at the time, you're flying with your crew and you don't even know it. You keep flying with this group of people. And eventually, a pilot picks his crew. And uh, all of a sudden, you realize you're flying, flying with the same guys for quite a while. Well, that's because they're setting up a crew. Mm -hmm. And if at any time a pilot is not happy with a member, all he has to say is, I want a new radio man, I want a new whatever and they'll just switch it, no mm -hmm. questions asked. So he's happy with his, his nine men. And one nice thing about it in the Air Corps, it's, it's uh, the camaraderie between officers and enlisted men. We went to ground school together, four officers, five enlisted men. We did everything together except uh, off the base. So you get to know each other very well. Mm -hmm. And so you really are a little group when you finally leave, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and how long from arriving in Arizona and then going to the other bases, as you mentioned, um, did you go off with, with this core group? Uh, let's see. Well, each one was about a month, so, so it would be, uh, uh, I'm trying to think. I went in in May, gunnery school, then these different bases. It was December. It was December when we were in Kansas, and they said, you're going overseas, but you're going to get an overseas leave before you ship out. And uh, then the overseas leave was a three-day pass, which not very many people could utilize, except people who lived in the neighborhood. I remember I was at 
Kansas City, and I went to Topeka for three days. You know, that was the overseas leave. And then we were on a troop train from there to Miami. Like I say, I lucked out all the way. Mm -hmm. I got to Miami, and we're shipping out by ATC, Air Transport Command. And all of a sudden, they picked out two crews for no special reason, but there was room on the Pan American Clipper, the old flying boat, the Boeing 314 which flew from New York to Africa, oh, two or three times a week, I think. The funny part is, when I was in school in New York, I had a job in the Shelton Hotel. And when it got busy, a slack, my boss would send me to the 33rd floor to count cans of tomatoes because there was a, a, a me, uh, this was a chain of hotels. There was a guy who used to come around and he'd fire anybody who looked like they weren't working. So my boss would send me up to count the tomatoes. I had a beautiful view of the East River and LaGuardia and Port Washington where the Pan American Clippers landed and took off. And little did I know that within a year I'd be in one because it was December and BC was playing in the Orange Bowl. And I was dying to go, and the officers were going to try and get tickets. My pilot got two, and we were told we would be in Miami over New Year's Day. Well, we did. We shipped out New Year's Eve. All of a sudden, about 5 o'clock, they said, get ready, and we sit around for a few hours. Actually took off at 3 a.m., but this flying boat was an experience. It had sleeping accommodations for 71 passengers, I believe. But when we flew it, all the petitions were down and it was loaded with cargo. And they had room for this, about 14 men. So that's right, it was one crew and, and other people. Some were high-ranking officers going overseas for some reason. I remember these two were uh, monetary experts going over to North Africa. And uh, in this one crew, my crew of nine men. And it was great. The meals were fabulous. Two stewards who cooked beautiful meals. It's a slow flying plane, you know. I mean, uh, I think its top speed was like 150 miles an hour. But it was huge. And uh, it was like a speedboat when it landed that the engineer would stick his head out of a little hole in the nose while the plane would, would uh, I think it was at Trinidad, there was a huge con convoy getting ready to leave. So there were hundreds, or it seemed like hundreds, of these freighters. So the ship had to land quite a ways, the plane had to land quite a ways, and zigzag around all these ships to go in where we could land. And it was great. And I remember the Andrews sisters had a song called uh, uh, Rum and Cokes in Trinidad. And <laughs> we were taken in a launch this flying boat couldn't always taxi up to where you could walk off. A launch would take you to shore where two Pan Am hostesses gave us rum cokes mm -hmm. while the plane was being gassed. And it started to rain, and they had rules all during the war about times where planes could land. And we couldn't take off from Trinidad after a certain time because we'd be landing too late at the next stop. So we were stuck and had to stay overnight. And I remember they took us to the Queen's Park Hotel and we stayed overnight. And I remember that's where Roosevelt stayed. He had been down there just a little while earlier on one of his trips. And the next morning we took off and we flew to Belim, which is on the Amazon. We flew over the, the uh, equator and the pilot dipped the plane to tell us. <coughs> and then he Eventually, they sent home a little diploma that we had crossed it. The equator pointed out Devil's Island. We landed at Belem on the Amazon. And, How uh, do you spell that? B E L E M. Mm -hmm. And the next stop was Natal, which is the furthest eastern point of South America. And that's where you'd fly from there to get to Africa. And we stayed overnight in Natal. And then we took off. And it, I remember it took 13 hours to fly from Natal to Fisherman's Lake, which is in Liberia, Monrovia, Liberia, which was 
a black nation founded by American blacks, I think. And we landed on a lake there, and that was the end of the Pan Am trip. I still have my ticket stub, $771 it cost for each one of us to fly that. It's probably not too different from today. And Uncle Sam picked up that tab. Yes. Uh -huh. So once you arrived in North Africa, what was the first thing that struck you about the area? Well, I think I remember saying, uh, wondering if I said hello to a, a black man who was uh, unloading baggage, whether if he could understand me, and he said, good morning, Sergeant, in very British English, which most people did in a lot of those countries because they learned through the British, I think, mm -hmm. you know. We flew from there to Accra, which was a huge air base that the Army had taken over in Ghana. Uh, I can't think of it the country, still there, right on the southern coast, right near the Gold Coast of Africa. And we were on our way over with no plane of our own, and we were waiting for rides, and I think we waited a week or so at Accra. And we used to go down to a beautiful beach and swim every day. No bathing suits, but there was nobody else around except mm -hmm. natives. Mm -hmm. And if we signaled, they would bring pineapples and bananas and the pineapples, they would just shave off the outside and you'd eat it like uh, corn on the cob. You know? mm -hmm. I was there for at least a week. And this was in January now? Mm -hmm. And the weather was beautifully Beautiful, warm? Beautiful, yes. Mm -hmm. And see, we were headed for India. We didn't know that then, where we were going. When did you find out you were going to Well, India? we did know then because we knew flying across the Atlantic. My pilot had the papers and that's when he was authorized to look at them and they said we were going to India because, go ahead, I don't want to talk too much. Um, at that time, did you know what was happening in India or surrounding areas? We didn't even know why we were going to India. Mm -hmm. We thought the war was somewhere else, you know. And uh, uh, it was because the Japanese were coming up through uh, uh, the East, Southeast Asia, Borneo, in Thailand, and they wanted to connect with the Germans in Europe. So they had, their plans were to go right through Bur Burma and India and somehow connect with Hitler's troops. So we were there to stop the Japanese from doing that. And uh, the trip across was interesting. We, would, we still hitched rides. We went from uh, Accra to, I remember, I read about Lagos, and, and I think that's in Nigeria. And we stopped at Khartoum. I always loved that because I remember reading about it, especially in British history, you know, in the war games they used to play in Africa. But I met a fellow from my hometown in Khartoum. Uh, he saw me get off the plane and uh, he was stationed there. So that was kind of interesting. And from there, oh, and I remember at Khartoum we stayed in a Greek college, they said it was, and we stayed on a balcony which had no, no, uh, walls. We, the bunks were all against a wall and there was a, a roof like this, but then it was just beautiful sky you were looking at. And so it was open. Yeah, very, and it's right on the Nile. And so we took off, flew across the Nile, landed at Eritrea, Asmara, Eritrea, in Ethiopia, where there was a huge American air base. I think there were about 3,000 civilians, Douglas employees, Douglas aircraft employees, and this was a place to service and repair planes. I think they could have built one there if they had to. It was a huge base. They had a flatbed trailer that did nothing but drive, circled it all the time at about 15 miles an hour. And if you wanted to go from one point to another, you just stepped on and stepped off. And we were stuck there three days because we had engine trouble. This was three C-47s, three Goonie birds, they called them, that were flying from Accra to India. And, and we had one of the planes was having engine trouble, so we had to stop. And we were there for three days. They had a great theater, and uh, outdoor theater, but great movies, and, uh, and the food was good. They had uh, Italian prisoners working in the kitchen. I remember they said one of the chefs was a general. And uh, there were buildings that had been damaged during the Ethiopian-Italian War, which was just before World War II broke out, 
all over. So they were prisoners of the Ethiopian government? No, they were then. It, this, was, this was the Italians. Uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. It was the Americans who ran the field. Yes, the Ethiopian, it was Ethiopian property, and they had been taken prisoner by the Ethiopians. They had lost that war, I believe, and mm. they were so sure of winning it all. And uh, some of the damaged buildings were still there. And uh, there were a few Italians that were still in prison. Most Italians were happy, I think, to be out working, but some were too hard to get along with and were still in prison. Up until this time, were you able, after leaving New York, mm -hmm. were you able to continue with any of your sketching or? I had a, brought a sketchbook and I did it off and on on the way. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't do enough, you know, really. Uh, but I did have, I brought a little sketchbook mm -hmm. with me and I did do things. So at this point in Ethiopia, did you know then you were going to India? Oh, yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're, after a few days. We're at an altitude of 5,000 feet, which is a mile like Denver. And every plane going west, going east, had an extra engine inside in it because they needed them over in India and China, and which made it a little heavy. And not too many people, maybe about 14 or 15 passengers, but cargo and a huge engine right in the middle of the cabin. And we were a little nervous because at 5,000 feet altitude takes a little longer runway to take off, <laughs> whether we'd take off all right, but we did. And we flew down the, the uh, Suez Canal. The, it's the, I can't think of a name now. Anyway, we landed on a corner of Arabia called Aden. The only the only part of Arabia you could touch and feel safe, it was a British base called Aden. And we were told not to fly across Arabia. If you had any kinds of engine trouble and were forced down, there was no, there were, no one knew what would happen to you. The Arabians hated flyers because of something that had happened with British flyers years before, and I guess they would really do them in whoever landed. So we didn't land in Arabia. We landed in Aden and ate. We always landed for gas. We'd ask if there was anything to eat, and this was a British base, and I remember the main course was fried tomatoes, which didn't seem too appetizing to me. But anyway, we flew right along the coast of Arabia and landed at a little island called Masira. And there were 42 people there. Uh, I think there were two Americans and the rest were British and they were setting up a base. And all they, they lived in tents and fuel was in huge tanks. Um, maybe there were 50 gallon drums. And if you needed fuel, somebody had to, they had a huge drum. They would open the smaller ones with a hatchet, dump it into the big one, and hand crank it into the plane. And that's how we got refueled in this island. And I stopped at the same island on my way home a year later, and they had barracks and a nice theater, and it was really fixed up. So it was brand new when we stopped on our way over. And that was our last stop before India. Mm -hmm. We landed in Karachi, India. That was my first stop there. And do you remember the sense that you or your peers had getting off the plane there? Oh yes, I, I was always intrigued by India. And of course we didn't, we didn't get to see the town or anything. We were taken right to an air base and it was a huge British air base. And I remember there were a lot of brick buildings because termites are great in India. And the barracks were all brick buildings. And one of the things that I enjoyed seeing was a was a little brick building with a clothesline and clothes on the line because it meant some British soldier's family was living there at the time. And uh, there was a B-24 there and the sad part, it was called Sad Sack and it had arrived from the USA and it had been sabotaged. And they found that uh, fuel lines and uh, had been cut and taped over with scotch tape and, uh, and little things like that. So that had been done in the States. And that plane made it as far as Karachi. And that's where they discovered all this. So it had to be fixed up. And was and this the plane that was waiting for your No, no, group? it was just a B-24. Okay. The only reason I mention it is while we were there, as usual, waiting for a ride to go further, 
we had to take turns guarding this plane. There were only, uh, uh, I think there were two crews there then at that time, two nine-man crews, and we took turns. We did everything. The officers and enlisted men peeled potatoes, made our own meals, and we had to take turns guarding that plane. And it was funny because uh, uh, everybody, the guy who guarded it had to carry a Tommy gun. We slept in, in brick barracks that had six bunks in a room with a single light hanging from the ceiling. And, and every bunk has a mosquito netting, you know, and you get in, you tuck it in all around. There's four posts that hold it up to keep the mosquitoes out. And one night, everybody's in, in my room, everybody's in their bunks, and the light is still on. And nobody wants to untuck the mosquito netting to set the light up. So the guy who was on, going on guard duty had the Tommy gun beside him. So he takes out the Tommy gun, <laughs> shoots at the light, and he missed it. But what a noise that made in the night. <laughs> right across the ceiling. <laughs> the mosquitoes were that bad that yeah. you didn't oh, want to yes. get out of the net? Yeah, malaria was a thing. You had to carry citronella all the time and have your cuffs down at night. And they didn't bite during the day, but at night you had to have long pants and long sleeves and citronella on places that were open. So, But when I left there, I left in the plane of a general, General Bissell, who was on his way to take charge of our, of the, I think, the group in India. And he came in in his private plane, a C-47, the famous Goonie Bird transport plane, and said, these two crews could ride with him. And I sketched him while he, we rode in this plane. I have a couple of little sketches. And uh, I remember the pilot of the other crew. My pilot's name was Tugun McCoy, because his name was McCoy. He was related to the Tennessee McCoys, of the feuding McCoys. Everybody called him Tugun McCoy. Well, the other pilot's name was Goad, G-O-A-D. And the reason I remembered was because he was from New Hampshire. So these two crews, we flew together, and we eventually ended up with the same squadron in India. And the thing that I'm, the reason I'm mentioning Goad is that he was on a mission where his plane blew up over the target. I wasn't on that mission, but the fellows who were said they saw no large pieces left when that plane blew. And so everyone was listed as killed in action. And a year and a half later, he turned up in a prison hospital in Rangoon. <laughs> he was the sole survivor. And his wife had remarried, because uh, heck, the whole crew was supposedly dead. And uh, he explained that the pilots had the best seat in the plane. Uh, they have a bucket seat that you cannot sit in unless you're wearing a parachute. So you're sitting on the parachute. They have a sheet of armor plate behind them one of the few sheets in the plane of armor plating is behind each pilot and beside the two waist gunners and there may have been armor plating on the bottom, I don't know. He said when that thing blew, he was protected by the armor plating and the bucket seat behind him and he was blown right through the window, the, the windshield. He said he had a few cuts and bruises, but that was it. He was protected from the explosion from the back. So that was a big surprise to, that he survived. So. And then he was captured? Yes, that was one of the hazards where we flew was because when anybody went down, you never knew what happened. The Japanese would never say, they used to send over planes the next day, P-38s, photo planes to look in the vicinity of where planes went down to see if they could see whether it was a safe crash landing or an explosion or whatever to try and decide because the Japanese would never say and you never knew. You never knew what happened to anybody who bailed out. So nobody wanted to bail out. And uh, the jungle looked like a sponge when you flew over it, you know. And the few people I know, and there were only two, who bailed out or survived uh, were picked up immediately. We carried what was called an escape kit. It was a leather patch, I don't know, uh, a cloth but canvas patch uh, that you put in a waist pocket that had uh, it had how to say I'm a good guy in seven different Burmese dialects and edible maps 
and a few other things. And we wore a money belt, which was about this thick, that had slots silver in it, just silver Indian rupees, and old silver, not new, that you could pay the natives with. And they wouldn't take it if it was new, because the Japs would know <laughs> there was something funny about it. This was supposedly to help. Well, the two fellows I know who bailed out and survived in both cases, they found natives first who motioned to follow them, and they took them to the nearest Japanese post, so it didn't do any good all the, you know, the money was, belt. Was there a sense that the Japanese would pay them to do that, or do you know no, that? No, there was a sense the Japanese would kill them if, if they, they thought they were helping. Yeah. Yes, you know, that it was that, their necks, really, you know. You couldn't blame them, I guess. But uh, like I say, we never knew what happened until afterwards. Mm -hmm. In this particular incident, the the uh, fellow I knew, and I followed it closely because of, of the accident, he was captured and he told me within a few days, and he had it very rough, and he, he had already been injured, and he was in uh, the prison for a year and a half. and. And when it was discovered, and this is when the British went in to take Rangoon, the Japanese left ahead of them. They found all these guys in prison. And once when I knew about this fellow, Gus Johnson and Goad, I saw his name in that thing. So, do you, do you want me to mention that or do you want me to yes. go on to something else? No, mention that. Because it's an interesting story. This, this, uh, I think, I know didn't do this very often, but uh, the reason for this was because when I got home, hold, I was, it, hold it out a little so the camera can, can see, you see it. it? Mm -hmm. When I got home, uh, I, I was in a barrack, no, I was in Atlantic City, and I met some other gunners from another company. We were all sent there to be restationed and reassigned, and one of them said he had a neighbor whose nephew was shot down in my theater, could he give me, give him my name? And I said, sure. And I heard from this man, and it was an uncle of a fellow, and he was on this plane. He wanted to know what happened. And I remembered it very well. I even remembered the date, October 26, 1943. And uh, this particular instance, it was near the end of my tour. Uh, it, was, it was probably on my 40th or so mission. And uh, we had what we call big raids. We started off with six, eight, or nine B-24s on a mission. Eventually it grew more and more. Near the end of my tour, it grew up to about 60 B-24s. And my pilot was lead pilot. I felt very important because I was lead tail gunner, because I would tell the pilot how everything was going behind him. And this particular case, uh, we had groups from China who had come down to help. And, and uh, this was a case where this particular plane was from our own squadron. We knew everybody. And he was having trouble. We had bombed Rangoon. We were on our way home. The ACAC was always very heavy over Rangoon. And there were a lot of fighters. After you leave the ACAC, the fighters come in. So I'm not sure. I'm sorry. What is that word you're oh, using? Oh, ACAC is, is anti-aircraft. Okay. As you're approaching a target, mm -hmm. as you go over it, they shoot at you with anti-aircraft, mm -hmm. which looks harmless because all it is is little black puffs. But if they keep coming closer, I used to duck down so I couldn't see it because you can't do anything about it. I swore at times I could feel a concussion on my feet when it went off. And you'd hear a shrapnel, but we were lucky we were never hit. Mm -hmm. But this guy was coming out of the, uh, on our way back, and the four engines were still running, but two, or at least two of them were smoking, and he was losing altitude and losing airspeed. So my pilot, Tugan, said, if we slow up and lose altitude, this guy can keep up with us. Well, we used to do that when we had small groups. And like I said, there were 60 B-24s, and nobody else slowed up except us. He was the lead pilot, but he didn't order it. He just suggested it, and nobody else did. So, eventually, there were only two B-24s. I put this one in, where was it? Just for artistic license, I suppose. To show what it actually well, would look like in the air? Yeah, but there were, at this point, there were only two B-24s, mine and his. 
and I'm watching the plane, telling my pilot what's going to happen. Huh? Can you show us on your plane where you would be? Well, I was in the very back, the okay. tail end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so I'm watching this plane for my pilot, telling him how he's doing and everything. And I didn't know, but at this point, the whole formation was about a mile ahead of us by then. And I'm watching this plane telling my pilot what's happening because there were three jet fighters flying along with it. Two, one on each side, like they were flying in formation. So you knew nobody was shooting out and either the gunners were injured or ran out of ammunition, which had happened. And the third Jap was making passes. Well, it, all of a sudden he hit the plane, the 24. I decided he misjudged. He was still making passes and pulled up too late, and his tail end hit the tail end of the 24 and knocked it off. There was an explosion, but not fire and gas. It was just like dirt and dust explosion. So that yellow and red is the, the Jap. smaller jet. I remember plane. seeing mm -hmm. a yellow wing, yes, and uh, and this just like dust. And I saw two shoots immediately, which I knew were the two waste gunners because if somebody knocks the tail end off the plane, they would fall out, and they always wore their parachutes. I worried, I didn't worry, I knew, I pitied the tail gunner, because there was no room in the tail turret for a parachute, and he probably flipped off in the space still sitting in the turret, because those turrets weren't on that good. But uh, it was a strange sight, because the plane still had four engines running, and going down in a very slow loop, with no tail end. And I watched as long as I could, but then the two Japs were coming after us and I had to watch them. I watched for quite a while. We were up 26,000 feet. And uh, so it took a while for that plane to go down. But, uh, and I remember that's what I, I told the uncle. The uncle wrote me a letter and asked me. So I wrote him a long letter of what happened and with little drawings and stuff and what I thought, and I said, you never know. I mean, at that altitude, people had time to jump, and uh, there was a hazard about bailing out too soon because the Japs would shoot you in a parachute. We were told to, to not pull the ripcord till you were close to the ground. And uh, anyhow, it wasn't until uh, a year and a half later that we found out Gus Johnson, who was the navigator in this plane, was the sole survivor, and he was found in this prison camp in, in Rangoon. And uh, he told me that when, and now they were all kind of dazed. He was injured, but not as bad. He told me he was walking around the plane trying to help people who were injured. And uh, you knew nobody was shooting back at these jabs. And uh, he, when he bailed out, I think they weren't even aware the plane was going down, you know? He said the navigator, the bombardier said he was going to bail out, and they went out through the, the navigator's hatch, which is the top of the plane. So the plane was upside down. He said we went down, and they were going down through the top. So the plane was upside down when they went out. He said, I think he bailed out too soon. He said, I'm sure he was shot by the Japs in, in his shoe. But when he bailed out, he said, he remembers very well, his chute opened, he swung this way, this way, and this, and he hit the ground. So he must have been about six, well, maybe 300 feet above the ground when his chute opened. You know. But uh, uh, we, I didn't watch the plane anymore because the Japs, the two fighters there started going for us, and we were all by ourselves then. And that's the one thing you watch out for in, in bombing, is not to be a straggler. But we weren't far from the coast. And I remember the Japs never followed us over the coast. I think they were afraid of water. And I used to look in my teal turret trying to see if I could see the coastline because I knew if I could see it, then they wouldn't follow us that over the water. But uh, so anyway, this was Gus Johnson, the nephew of the man who wrote me. And at the time, I didn't know. That's why I made the drawing. I was in a rest camp, convalescent center, not convalescing from anything except uh, some in, in Atlantic City where they decide to reassign you and you're gonna my biggest worry when I came back was overseas from overseas was what was I gonna do and where were they gonna assign me? And I said, Well I hope it's not a instructor's job because that's a flying job and I didn't wanna I, I heard stories about gunners who had great war records and got killed in stupid accidents back home and, as instructors. Well somebody heard that and that's when they sent me 
to a rest camp, and I didn't want to go. And they said, they say you're suffering from combat fatigue, and I wasn't suffering from anything. I was just sick of flying. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so anyway, I went, and I was, and it was a beautiful place, at Pauling Prep School, Pauling, New York. And they had an art class there with professional artists who had been drafted, and and uh, you could, you had to spend half your day in something athletic and half your day in something academic. I loved to swim, so I spent half a day in the pool and half a day in the art class. So I was in an art class and I was just fooling around one day, trying to do this from memory, because at this time I was corresponding with the uncle. And, uh, and that, not knowing at that time that whether the, the gentleman had, was alive. Right, not knowing. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I corresponded with the uncle for quite a bit, until, right up until he was found. And uh, which was a year and a half later. And when he came home, the uncle said, he won't talk about it. He won't say anything, and you couldn't blame him. And then I got a letter once, and uh, he, he had written down disconnected sentences that the fellow would say once in a while. And uh, uh, so, and the gist of it was what happened when he hit the ground. He said, we were going to fire a shot. He, this is, so this is conflicting stories. The first time he told me, they were each going to fire a shot. We always all carried 45s. And he said he heard a shot, and he fired a shot, but no one had ever heard of the other guy again, the, the navigator who was mm -hmm. with him when they bailed out. And did you ever hear from either uh, Gus Johnson or the uncle oh, yes. about his treatment while oh, in yes. prison? Yeah, he was very treated very badly. He was on uh, a solitary confinement for most of the time. And, uh, and that's why he wouldn't talk about it. He had a very rough time as a, in a Japanese prison. Mm -hmm. and, uh, Can we take that picture now? And, um, sure. Did you ever meet him? No, but I've talked to him on the phone. Did you ever meet Mr. Johnson? No, I didn't. Uh, I, when I found out he was alive, I had, that was the end of my correspondence with the uncle. We, we wrote a little bit and then sort of lost track. And. Uh, it wasn't until, uh, oh, the reason I dug this picture out, they were making a history of the seventh bomb group, and there were questions in a newspaper, a little paper I get, that said, asking about certain crews, did anybody know about certain missing crews that went down? And one of them was this particular crew where the pilot's name was Vaughn, and I, right off the bat, it rang a bell. So I wrote, and told them my story, and I even sent them a Xerox, which didn't come out too good of that picture, and what I had happened. And I said, I heard there was one survivor, because I had read about it, and I said, I thought his name was uh, Gustafson. I didn't remember. And they wrote back and said, yes, you were right, and his name was Gus Johnson, and he was the sole survivor. So then, and that they were doing that for this history book. Now, in in my version, I told them, we had bombed Rangoon, we were on our way home when this happened, and the version in the history book is wrong. And I wrote and told them my story so they didn't listen to me, because they said a formation of bombers on their way to Rangoon was attacked, and it was on the way back, and it wasn't a formation by then, there were just two of two us of in you. the sky. So anyway, uh, I thought, oh, then I saw a picture because I get these little papers. One is called the XCBI Roundup. One is called Briefing, which is about B-24 histories. And one of them had a picture of POWs meeting out in Texas. And one was a fellow named Johnson. It didn't say where they were from or anything. It just said Gus Johnson. So I thought, gee, that must be him. And I looked, and I had a roster, and I had a name. And, I, I, uh, and an address in Florida. So I wrote him and said he, if he's the one, maybe he'd be interested, and he'd call me right away. And uh, <clears throat> so he really was interested, and I sent him copies. I think I sent him two or three color copies of the picture, and uh, because he was never sure what happened, see? And I was the closest guy in the sky. You were an eyewitness. <laughs> Except for the two Japs, I was the closest there. I was the tail end of my plane, you know. And uh, so he thanked me, and we've corresponded off and on. And the sad part is, he's not well. Uh, I just heard from him before Christmas. And uh, he's got a great attitude if you listen to him talk. Well, he did very well in the service. After he got back, 
he stayed in the service. And of course, in my case, I couldn't wait to get out. I knew I wasn't going to do anything hot in the service. And uh, he said he stayed in. And the reason he stayed in, he, he was sickly, needed medical help. And he said, when I discovered how much trouble people have going to VA hospitals, I decided to stay in and I could just walk down the street. Mm -hmm. And that's why he stayed in, because mm -hmm. of his health. And he ended up becoming a jet pilot and flew B-52s and then retired. And the last picture I saw, which was probably five or six years ago, he looked quite healthy. But the last I heard from him, which was just before Christmas, and we talked on the phone, and like I say, we weren't great friends. He was an officer and I would enlist him, but everybody knew everybody. Mm -hmm. In fact, I had a list of portrait customers that I used to do over there. And I remembered I did them for 25 rupees, which was like about $8. So these would be other servicemen? Yeah, I did everybody. When, and I always had a long list because I couldn't always get together when I was free and they were free and mostly pastels and all I had was a little box of what they call new pastels, the square ones, they were easy to carry and I did them on wrapping paper and ammunition came in boxes about this big, about this thick, this wide, this high and double thick cardboard on each side. They made beautiful folders, corrugated cardboard, that's what I do the pictures uh, I mean, I'd do it on wrapping paper, put them in those, and it was a great shipping thing. And I had a customer list, and I felt so bad when Gus Johnson was shot down because he was on my list and I hadn't done his picture. You know. mm -hmm. But he was a handsome Nordic-type blonde, you know. And, now, uh, you were a young, at that time, about a 21-year-old. Well, I was old. I was like 24. 24. In fact, and I, and I corresponded with a fellow today who was 27, and everybody called him Pappy. So most of them were 21, 22. So that you yeah. were the older group. I was a little older. So you had, in your experience, not only seeing something like this, but you had some close calls yourself being in the position that you were in. Well, yeah, you get shot at, you know, and the ACAC is the, I think the scariest thing because you feel better shooting back at fighters. The thing I liked about my war was it's nothing personal. You don't see anybody. You don't see anybody get killed. You're shooting at an airplane. Maybe there's somebody in it, you know? Mm -hmm. And even bombing, we were always bombing at military targets. I knew there were times that we probably missed, but we knew, they knew we were coming. They had bomb shelters. We usually bombed railroad yards, bridges, shipping, in docks and stuff like that. Even so a, a typical time. week, were you on for a number of hours or a number of days and then off? How did no. that go? Uh, every two or three days in my war, you would fly. I remember writing home once to my then girlfriend saying, you know, it's a pretty good job. I only work three or four days a week, and it's steady work, and there's no chance of getting laid off. <laughs> mm -hmm. But uh, uh, yeah, about every two or three days, you'd go look, check the bulletin board and, and see if you were scheduled to fly. And, uh, and we flew during the monsoon. This famous General Bissell said that once, we shall operate during the mon monsoon, and which meant he never had to. The monsoon was... Uh, a beautiful morning, you'd take off and head into a sky that was black as ink. And the planes would spread out, and you'd keep flying. And if you flew for 45 minutes and were still in the storm, you were supposed to turn around and come back. So you, if you got through, then they'd reform and go on target. Monsoon is raining off and on every day for uh, six months. Very and hard rain? Very hard rain. All the walks between barracks were raised because everything becomes a pond, mm -hmm. a flood, you know. But uh, no, we, we flew quite steadily. Uh, I, I ended up with 46 missions. We had no, no uh, limit. You flew until they sent you home. And uh, one, of the, one of the, I was telling the girls the other day, there was a fellow named Miller. Oh, they don't ask you to fly substitute once you've gotten a few missions in. They won't make you fly substitute on any other anybody else's crew. Because whenever a plane goes down, there was always at least one guy on it that didn't belong on that crew. So, but we had a co-pilot named Paul Height, one of the nicest guys, and he sprained his ankle playing softball. 
so he missed a few missions and uh, he he wanted to he volunteered to fly another cruise to catch up with us and screw me he volunteered on a flight and the plane they flew to Calcutta to take off because it was in conjunction with British fighters and it was a new airfield and once his plane took off they weren't aware of the area and they banked and hit a tree or something. It was at night, you know, and they didn't see where they were going and the, the plane crashed. There was one survivor, but Paul Height was our co-pilot and he was a substitute on that plane. So naturally we got the guy whose place he took, John Miller, who it probably had a head cold and so he didn't fly that day, I don't know. Anyway, he had an interesting life. We used to go to Calcutta for nine days Oh, a couple of three times I did. I think I went. And, and you'd take the train. And, and this uh, was like time off? Yes, mm -hmm. it was a leave. And they had a suite of hotels and rooms in the Grand Hotel. And a crew would come in as a crew was leaving and spend about nine days. And it was great. And uh, Miller, like a lot of officers, to come back, uh, finagled a ride on a plane, a mail plane that go, was stopped at all the air bases and leaving Calcutta. And he finagled a ride on this mail plane, but he overslept that morning, and the plane blew up, uh, crashed on takeoff, and everybody was killed. So he was lucky there. And there was a third instance where he lucked out. I can't remember what it was, but I remember there were three. So my pilot and co-pilot, this was now Miller, lived in two men barracks, and each had a room and a little anteroom where they could write letters with a central doorway with steps. And I used to go over there and play records. One of them had a phonograph record that you cranked. And I loved music, and we had no radio, and so they didn't care if I didn't mind the cranking, and i just sit on the step playing records while these two guys are writing letters. And this one night, we were scheduled to fly the next day, and I heard Miller say to Tugun, you know, Tugun, my sinuses are acting up. I'm not sure I can go tomorrow. And I thought, oh well, you know. Well then a little while later he said it again. And when the third time he said, I don't think I can go tomorrow, I'm gonna to check in with the flight surgeon. And I said, if you're not going, I'm not going. I said, you're too blooming lucky. And I really didn't wanna go. But you don't know what. Anyway, I went home and you, you get up and you go to the briefing. And uh, after the briefing, you go out and wait for trucks to take you out to the base. And it was probably it was pitch dark, so it was probably 4 a.m., and we're standing there waiting for the trucks. And I kept thinking, boy, this guy Miller is too blooming lucky. I don't want to go on this mission today. But you can't quit, you know? And I really didn't want to go. And I didn't have to. The, the trucks didn't come, and we waited and waited, and they didn't come. And then we got word that the mission was canceled. <laughs> so. I was like, I really lucked out, but where I really lucked out was that day I found out I was going home. So I had already flown my last mission and didn't know it. Because one of the scariest things I think is when you know you've only got one more mm -hmm. or two more, but we didn't know. They shipped us home when a new crew came in and they'd ship home the crew with the most time. And how did you get home? Same way, same the Goonie birds mm -hmm. flew from, from uh, our base to across uh, India to Karachi, stopped at Mysterio, the same little island, and uh, Khartoum, and ended up in Accra, and waited in Accra again for about uh, a week or so for a plane west, because priority was given to ferry pilots, and we were going home, we had no priority, so we just, and I remember thinking it was December, and we'd still go, swimming at the same beach, but then we had to wear trunks because things had changed and now there were army nurses and a lot of people around. But I, was, I remember lying on that beach thinking, boy, they think I'm fighting a war. And I was on my way home and there was no way of anybody knowing. So was this December of 43? Yep, same year I took off, January 1st, 43. And I landed in Miami on Christmas night, 43. So it was almost just a year. Do you remember what your feelings were like when you landed on oh, U.S. soil again? Oh yeah, everybody has that feeling of, uh, you really want to kiss the ground, but I didn't. <laughs> was it emotional? Yeah, I think so, but not too, you're just happy. But 
I took the train home. They would fly you anywhere you wanted to go. There were always military planes, and they'd get you a seat on any military plane. And I decided to take the train. Uh, and uh, I took the train from Miami to New York, which was about 24 hours. I didn't fly for about 15 years after that. And I wasn't afraid, I was just sick of it. I just didn't feel like flying anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, had a great experience, really. What were some of your memorable experiences? You, you mentioned a few things, such as the, the, the mosquito nets and oh, shooting yeah. the bulb. What other humorous or? Well, one of the funniest, I think, uh, in a plane they have relief tubes, which is for relief. There's one behind the pilot and one in the waist for the waist gunners, and it's just a funnel and a hose. I used to wash my tail turret window before takeoff on every mission. And, uh, and when, you, when you fly, you, you, I mean, our missions averaged almost 10 hours a mission. So you stand around the pilot talking a while, and, and finally, when you get up near 10,000 feet, you have to get in position because that's when you start using oxygen. And I'd get in my teal turret, and the window would be all wet and dirty. And I finally figured it out. It was when somebody used the relief tube, it dribbled along, <laughs> and got all over my glass. So I used to, finally, I asked the guys, please don't use the relief tube till we're on our way home, you know? <laughs> and one day, I'm in my turret, and uh, I happen to look, and there's a stream right about wing level on my right, and that, there were wing tanks, you know? And I thought, shoot, that looked like gasoline coming out of a wing tank. And I opened my doors and leaned back, and one of the waste gunners is standing up, <laughs> going out the window, so he wouldn't, <laughs> get my glass dirty. <laughs> I thought that was so funny. Tom, do you want to show us your jacket and oh, yeah. your other pieces? Yeah, this, well, we had this on our jackets. In China, they had a different one in Chinese that said, I think I'm a good guy. But we all had the American flag. And this is the original. I had the jacket cleaned. When I came home, they said you can wear the jacket, but take off the insignia. So I, I took it all off. Well, just a few years ago, I had it cleaned up and had a tailor. Could sew you move it up, up like in front of you, maybe? Mm -hmm. And this is the the patch we had, the China Burma India patch, mm -hmm. and then the other is the Air Corps patch. Could you show that into the Air Corps patch into the camera? Yep. Hold it up. Yep. This was general. Most of the time, you wore one that fitted your your. Air Force. I was in the 10th Air Force. You never hear anything about the 10th. You always hear about the 8th. The 8th has a history that looks like a dictionary. The 10th has a history that looks like a, a little tiny sheet. <laughs> but one you'll never forget, I'm right, sure. Right, yeah. And, and show the front again. The front. And you always had wings, and this is my name. It still says T.L. Grady, but you can hardly see it. Can you hold it up again? And, uh, and we usually used uh, leather wings, but I couldn't find it, and that's uh, the metal ones that we wore in dress uniform for gunners, uh, crewmen's wings, you know. And, and then show the, us here in the inside. Well, it's kind of worn. Oh, oh the hat. Okay. This is the hat, yeah. And I remember how this got broken. Uh, we had an accident on takeoff once. Uh, Can you just hold that up one sure. second? And, yeah. and while you're talking, go ahead. Well, it's got a, it's broken. The bill is broken. This was the summer flying. We had great clothes, I think. The summer flying, the winter flying outfits were very good. But, but we had an accident on takeoff once. Uh, the landing gear collapsed, and we had. And I remember this when this got broken. Uh, it had nothing to do with it. Uh, we had 12 500-pound bombs on board, and we're going down the runway. And I'm one of the few people who knew it because everybody stood around the pilot talking. And I like to see out. So I used to squeeze by the radio table in this little window and just look out. And I could tell we were tilting down just by looking out. And I thought, I wonder if we got a, a flat tire in the nose wheel. And the next thing, the belly's hitting the cement. And then sparks and dirt are coming right up by us. And uh, I was nervous because I saw the yellow cone, which meant the end of the cement, end of the cement. And I thought that, you know, in the Inja, because of the rain, they had ditches about 20 feet wide, 10 feet deep, all around the runways. And I thought, oh shoot, we're going to hit the ditch. But fortunately, because the landing gear was going up properly, 
which means the nose comes up, then the right gear, it went around in a big ground loop, and we just stopped. But bombs were all over the place, and the bomb bay doors were sheared off. And that's where we were really lucky, because three of the bombs were live from, the, from, from that action. And uh, they, uh, uh, I remembered, I thought they were safe, but uh, they gave the gentleman who de-armed them, what's the word, defused them the silver star. So that's where we were really lucky. We had 12, it would have only taken one. Anyway, coming back on the truck, my hat fell off. And another truck ran over it, so I remember that so But well. you were still able to retrieve it. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so once you got home to New York, yes. is that when you went into the art school for a rest? Oh, no. In New York, uh, when I actually got home and, and went to, took the train to New York and then to Boston, then home to New Hampshire, uh, no, I had to report back to Atlantic City for, and that was where they decide what you're going to do. And Atlantic City was great because what they do is check everything. They check your records and your health record and payroll to see if everything's straight when you leave. And they have four weeks to do it. And you can, and these are beautiful hotels you're living in. And the only thing you have to do is read the bulletin board to see if you were, had any meetings that day. Otherwise, you, did, you could just take off. And it was great. And I was there in January. And supposed to be there four weeks and all of a sudden my name is up to leave and that's when I'm told I'm going to a rest camp and I didn't want to go until the guy said they got an art crash there and all that so I was at the rest camp for uh, maybe six months there were guys there who were really convalescing mm -hmm. men with physical injuries that were well but not well enough to go back to duty they might still be on crutches or something like that and it was a great place because you had to take courses, but they had great entertainment. We had Broadway shows come up and entertain us. Mm -hmm. Oklahoma, they couldn't put on the show, but the cast would all come up. Eddie Cannon, come up. Lowell Thomas, Herbert Hoover would come up. We had lectures every Friday. Mm -hmm. And they had dances uh, one night a week where they'd bring in girls from surrounding schools, mostly prep, but some from Vassa. We weren't far from the Hudson and jukebox dances, you know, and, and uh, it was great. I had, really had a good time there. And I met Colonel Cock in there. Uh, Terry and the Pirates had a character called Flip Corkin, and it was based on Colonel Philip Cochran, who was a real person, and I met him, and he was a little shorter than I, with gray hair, crew cut, about 37 years old, and a full colonel. And, uh, he was very well known and he was upset because he was known because he was the character for the char character in in the comic strip rather than his war record because he was a great fighter pilot and he engineered the first glider invasion of World War II which was in Burma where they tried gliders and I used to see him in the pool that's how I got to see him he was a swimmer and I was a swimmer and, and we were uh, nodding acquaintances, I guess you'd say. But I met him in Grand Central Station a while later. First time I'd ever seen him in uniform because all he ever wore was a khaki shirt and blue dungarees. Mm -hmm. And I met him coming towards me uh, in Grand Central Station and I said, oh, we're indoors, I don't have to salute because you're not supposed to salute officers. And I felt real good because he nodded and I nodded. <laughs> I thought that was nice. So were you discharged from there? From Westover. I, mm -hmm. I was stationed at Westover after that. See, I finally was reassigned to Westover Field. Mm -hmm. And I was assigned to Westover because I was no, or was taken off flying status. So I wanted to get something in the art line, and the only number they had was for draftsmen. So I was sent to Westover as a draftsman. And it was fun because I did posters and chats for the flight train. They were training B-24 crews, still training them there. Mm -hmm. And I big, did big charts. I did pictures of B-24s, just outlined, just showing their hydraulic system or things like that, large ones, so they could show a class. And this mm -hmm. is before all these view graph things they have today, of course. And it was fun. It was an interesting job, but I was a staff sergeant. And then they began sending people, fellows who had never been overseas into the infantry. And because I was a staff sergeant,
they made me a supply sergeant because they shipped two guys, a corporal and a tech sergeant, off to the war. And I took their place as a supply sergeant. And I had, that was the worst part of my career because I couldn't handle supplies. And, uh, and it was, off, it was uh, office supplies. We were training 3,000 troops, 3,000 crewmen on B-24s in three different hangars, a thousand in each one, and I had to keep track of supplies for this group. And my problem was uh, officers taking things and shipping out without returning them. And I'd have an item missing with a signature, and the man would have left. That was my big problem, trying to locate supplies. But so I was discharged from there, so that was good. And then did you go home to the dairy area, yeah, East Dairy? Yes. Mm -hmm. And what, what did you do to pick up your life after that? Well, the first thing, I wanted, to, I wanted to get a job. And my only trouble was I had four years of art school and no experience. And you can go to art school forever, but experience is what they want. And answering an ad, I got an art job in a, in a, a printing place in Lawrence. And you know, you could go to school on the GI Bill also, you could get a job and the GI Bill would pay part of your pay. So a company could hire you and pay you $25 and the government might pay you, like at the time I started at $50 a week, half and half. Mm -hmm. But it was great. It was an art department in a shoebox company and this was the department that did the designs on the shoeboxes. And it was fun and I learned a lot about the business and I probably should have stayed. But I didn't. <laughs> But it was good, it was an art job, you know, mm -hmm. and I was happy doing it. And then you continued on in your career? Always something in art. I switched from different things. I, I did Christmas cards and I, I, uh, I ended up doing technical illustration. At a, I, I worked at Raytheon, but I could not get in their department at all. I worked there as a draftsman trying to get in the art department, but it was very hard, and I got a job at another company where I was doing technical illustration, which, and we did ink drawings on blue cloth, and it's the same thing they do today on computers, exploded views, cutaway views, if you want to see inside something, and this is all by hand and ink. And uh, it was fun, and it was very interesting. And then I went from there to Honeywell as a graphic designer because tech illustration was gone. And I ended up retiring from Honeywell as a graphic designer. But I'm lucky, I've always been in some phase of art, anyway. I would add right now that your artwork is on display here oh, at our yes. library for the month of February. Yeah, watercolor has always been a hobby. And uh, uh, I tell people I keep doing it to see if I can ever do it right. But Because uh, I, I like oils and acrylics, but I just keep fooling around with watercolors. How important do you think serving in the military was? And, and second part to that question, how it affected you in the rest of your life? Well, I, I always think the, the biggest thing that bothers me, it stopped my career for almost four years. And what, you, what I might have done, I was going to school in New York City, and I had ideas of when I got out of there, getting a job as a flunky in an agency. You know, starting at nothing and working your way up, which is the way most people did it. But when I got out of the service, I was married and had a child. And you can't do that. You've got to find a job. I did illustration, but the trouble with the illustration, it's all, we'll call you when we need you, you know? Mm -hmm. And uh, you can't wait. You've got to do something. And I did a lot of things. I worked for a company that was very interesting, but it folded. And it was like illustration. And it was doing pictures on plastic and edge lit plastic and they were in mounted in aluminum frames with fluorescent tubes all around four sides and if you painted on the plastic if you painted with a brush the light would stop but if you painted with a sponge a stipple the light would go right through so and the Sheridan Corporation liked this and we did pictures in about 12 Sheraton hotels I had four or six pictures in the Copley Plaza way back. And they were my original drawings of um, Hans Christian Andersen's Nightingale. Quite often, it was a woman, the, de the chief decorator for Sheridan, 
a woman named Mary Morrison Kennedy, graduated of MIT. She would come and tell me what she wanted, but she'd usually bring something. She might bring a book of somebody else's illustrations and say, we want these. And I would duplicate them, but I'd duplicate them about four by six, uh, three by six vertical pictures on plastic. And they were beautiful because they lit up at night. Some of these cocktail lounges, the only light in the room was from these pictures. Mm -hmm. But I was getting maybe 70 bucks a week at the time. And it was an expensive business because of the plastic, two, two sheets of quarter inch plastic. We did two to have a foreground and a background because it was too much for one sheet to light up and building the frames and everything. And it just wasn't a money making thing, but mm -hmm. Boy, I loved it. It was illustration. And it was very suitable for underwater scenes. I did a lot of underwater scenes. Did you, do you ever see any of those pieces No, I today? don't ever know what happened to them. Mm. They probably just got thrown out. How no do you, one of the questions that we ask a number of our uh, interviewees is if you have a feeling or a sense about the difference of public opinion with regards to your generation, World War II veterans, versus those who were in the Korean conflict and those who were in Vietnam War. Would yeah. you like to expand on that at all? Well, I think the sad part is ours was a good war. It was the kind of a war where you wanted to go in <coughs> and, and help out. And, and I don't know, it doesn't seem, sometimes it doesn't seem to me that, that we should be everybody else's uh, protector, you know? I had two boys in Vietnam, but if one of them, if anything had happened to one of them, I'm not sure I would think it was a good idea. Although I was glad they did not refuse, you know, mm -hmm. they both, well, Tom uh, joined the Army knowing he was going to be a helicopter pilot. I mean, he knew from high school that was, he was good, the program he was going to be in, and he knew he was going to Vietnam. Kev joined the Navy, I mean the Air Corps, because he was going to Northeastern and his marks weren't too good. <laughs> Did, that was common back then, yeah, though. Yeah, he didn't realize it was so easy. He was a good student, but he almost flunked out because it, it was too easy. And then I think he was embarrassed and joined the aircraft. And, but Tom, he flew as a pilot and did his tour in Vietnam, had some great experiences. I wish I knew more because he's not living now. And, uh, but he stayed in in the Far East and, and when he was discharged and flew for Air America, which people called the CIA's not so secret airline. And he flew for them for seven years and he actually was in Saigon the very last day picking people up uh, and ended up on one of the Navy ships offshore on that mm -hmm. last day. And Kev was in the Air Force in Vietnam when Tom was there and they met a couple of times. The first time, Kev was in a, in, a, in a dispensary as a medic and Tom flew over and landed on the pad and uh, left the road of running and ran in and said hi. That was the first time they met. After that, they met a lot in Psycho. And were you as a parent ever concerned that both of your sons were in a controversial war at the same time? Oh, sure. But see, but Tom wasn't with the military then. He was no. in a, a, a thing he volunteered for, Air America, which was a little different, you know? Mm -hmm. No, I know, but I felt for all the parents who did and, and, and whose sons were injured or lost because I'm not sure how I'd take it. I'd say, why, why is it our responsibility, all these foreign laws, mm -hmm. you know? I think that would really bother me. Finishing up this interview, is there one thought or comment that you'd like to leave us with to share not only with your family but with the community? Boy, I can't think of anything. I think the service is a great experience for anybody. I think it, it's good. I think a lot of people who don't should have been in. I think it's a very great experience. Uh, I don't know. I can't think of anything. I'm not a philosopher, I guess. Well, we would like to thank you this afternoon. This has been a fascinating afternoon for us, and we really appreciate your taking the time to come in. Well, thank you for thank having you. me. I enjoyed it. Good. Thank you.